Hello everyone, welcome to IAS Baba 60 days rapid revision series for prelims 2022. So this is day 6 and we are taking up environment and ecology. Friends, as and when we remember environment and ecology. So here we have different types of questions UPSC asks in the prelims. So the keywords it might be some organizations, NGOs, some species of animals or some concepts for that matter or some facts regarding the data or the UN conventions. So all those things. So here we have a blend of all those things and whichever are in the current affairs. So we'll remember them. So firstly, the overview of the key ecotomes like the ecosystem, ecoton, etc. But however, UPSC doesn't ask all these terms, but a new emerging term or any new term in the market. So those will be asked. So here I have some of the words we discuss. So biointensive integrated pest management or the BIIPM. So here it is a systems approach to pest management based on an understanding of pest ecology. So on the basis of pest ecology, we are going to make sure that we will manage them. And here chemical solutions will only be used as a last resort. So least chemicals are used and they are used only in exceptional cases. Then instead the appropriate responses would be the use of sterile males and biocontrol agents. Okay. Say for example, if we introduce sterile males, the, the population of a species will drastically reduce. So such tricks are being used to biomanage the pests and come to the next soil solarization. So here we are making use of the solar energy to disinfest or to make sure that the soil will be rid of all the pathogens. So how we are doing that? Say for example, we have a moist soil here. We are covering that soil with a polythene cover and this polythene cover as, acts as the greenhouse agent and here whatever heat that is being trapped. So that heat, it will kill the soil pathogens. So the soil solarization is a disinfection mechanism by using solar energy. And then we have biofumigation. So biofumigation, fumigation means spraying. So whenever dengue comes, municipality people, they spray those gases. So here biofumigation means we will cut those dead and decayed leaves into smaller parts. And these smaller parts will be spread all over the field so that they convert into fertilizers. And then we have pruning. Pruning is nothing but cutting down the branches and leaves of the tree so that its stem will increase in its width. And this is also a part of making sure that the growth will be enhanced. So if you don't prune, then the trees will not grow in the width. They just grow taller. So these are some of the ones. Then moving further, push and pull agricultural pest management. So here we have some push crops and pull crops. Push crops are those which will repel some of the microorganisms and pull are the ones which will absorb. Say for example, BT cotton. So it is a push crop. It will repel the ball worms. So by using these, we are going to manage the pest. Say for example, here we have the cereal crops like maize or sorghum. So they are often infested by the stem borers. So these are the pull crops for the stem borers and grasses planted around the perimeter of the crop, they attract and trap the pests. So here we are using the pull agent and some others like the desmodium plant. So they act as the pushers. So that is they repel the pathogens from the crops. So such ones can also be used for pest management. And then we have polyculture. Polyculture is very much similar to the multi-cropping. That is it involves growing multiple crop species in one area. And these species often complement and they enhance the biodiversity of that area. And then we have biodynamic farming. So in this biodynamic farming, here we are using the biological agents. And apart from that, we are also using the environment like the air, water, sunlight and others. And this is very similar to organic farming. So just like we have the zero budget natural farming. So this is one of them. And here remember there are the anthroposophy, the anthroposophy. So this is uh, ecological and holistic growing practices. So it uses the environment as well as the biology. So air, water and other elements along with the pathogens, the plant life, animal life. So we are integrating all these. And here the application of animal manures like the farm animals and covering the crops like mulching and then the rotation of crops. So all these are being used. So very informal one, very similar to organic farming. So that much we remember here. Then come to next global methane and carbon dioxide budget. So friends, by seeing the word budget, we get to know that budget is something like the expenditure and income. So this is not a tough concept to remember, but who will come up with all these things? 
So this is an important fact to be remembered. The Global Carbon Project, so this comes up with all this. It is an organization that seeks to quantify the global greenhouse gas emissions and their causes. And this was established in 2001 and its projects include the global budgets for carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide. And in 2020, the project released its new global methane budget and the first global nitrous oxide budget. So here remember the global carbon project okay, and remember the budget they have released and it was founded as a partnership among. So who are the partners for this global carbon budget? They are international geosphere biosphere program. So international geo bio program and then the world climate program, the international human dimensions program and diversitas. So this and then the umbrella of the earth systems and partnership. Okay, so all these they form the partnerships there. So make sure that you will do some research on these also and see who are they and whether they have any connections with the UNEP or UNDP or any other United Nations organizations or whether they are purely private ones. So such research you have to make because whenever UPS asks a question, one statement will be there that is it is a UN Bureau or it is under the aegis of United Nations. So we have to make sure that whenever we learn about various institutions which are active in ecology, so whether they are linked to United Nations or not, so that we will clarify. And then many core projects in this partnership subsequently became the part of Future Earth in 2014. So Future Earth, so this is again an umbrella project. So all these projects and budgets, so they came under this one. And then coming to the global methane budget, so this provided Okay, an estimation that the global methane emissions are around 570 metric tons and this includes emission from the natural sources that is 40% and anthropogenic or human related sources as 60%. So here it is like human activity are contributing more and the natural are the lesser ones. But obvious always whenever pollution comes the anthropogenic activity is the major culprit. And then there is one more tight report. The report titled Global Methane Assessment Benefits and Costs of Mitigating Methane Emissions. So this was released by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and the United Nations Environment Program. So don't confuse with the methane budget and the methane assessment report. So this is under this CCAC and UNEP. So remember these things and then coming to a brief on those. So the wetlands, so they are the major contributions. So mark this as important. And then comes the agriculture and anthropogenic and energy related, the oil, gas, coal. So all these are also important emitters of methane and then the waste, solid and liquid waste and the biomasses and other things. So here the top three, if you remember, that is more than sufficient. Then eco sensitive areas of Western Guards. Friends, this is always in use in the case of the Gadgil committee and also the Kasturi Rangan committee. So all those we have been studied. And again, it is in news. Why? Because recently there was a controversy over proposed eco sensitive zones around Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. So, here the Wayanad Lake, the Kerala areas, and the bottom Western Guards, all those become important. So, on January 28, the Ministry of Environment and Forest published a draft notification to declare an ESZ uh, around Wayanad Wildlife Sanctuary. And however, the state government is of the view that the densely populated areas should be excluded while measuring eco sensitive zones. So instead of 118 uh, square kilometers, so the state government is suggesting 88 square kilometers. And then there are other concerns of the farmers as well. That is the lives of thousands of farmers will be hampered and then the road construction, house construction and others will be hampered. So again, there is a Kasturi Rangan and Gadgil type of issue that is in the offing. So we will make sure that this we update again and again. And now what is an eco-sensitive zone? So eco-sensitive zones are also known as ecologically fragile areas. So those which are weak and which are in the verge of destruction. And eco-sensitive zones are areas notified by the Ministry of Environment and Forest under the protected areas, national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So these are around these national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So these act as shock absorbers or these act as buffer zones between these. Okay. So around in every national park, around every wildlife sanctuary, so we can have one eco-sensitive zone. And as per the National Board for Wildlife, so the delineation of eco-sensitive zones have to be site specific. So for every site, so we have to delineate. 
and remember this national board for wildlife so this is being set up under the wildlife protection act and prime minister will be heading this so this is one of the most powerful body in environment and ecology we remember them and then and the activities should be regulative in nature and not prohibitive unless required so in these eco sensitive areas or eco sensitive zones we should not prohibit everything we have to regulate only so some interference of human beings should be allowed because these are not the core national parks or wildlife sanctuaries they are just the buffer zones so we remember these and then come to next protected areas so we saw about the eco sensitive zones which are the buffer zones so in that context we study all those national parks wildlife sanctuaries and others so coming to national parks so this is the iucn category 2 protected area so iucn also has various categorization and national parks come under the category 2 protected area and national parks are designated only by the central government that to under the wildlife protection act and the demarcation and the declaration is done by the national board for wildlife where pm is the head okay and then coming to wildlife sanctuary here both central and state government they can declare a wildlife sanctuary and these wildlife sanctuaries so they are being uh, declared only to protect any wildlife so not the whole ecosystem only wildlife and this is under the iucn category 4 protected area and then biosphere reserves so this biosphere reserves so this is a new innovation under the man and biosphere program of united nations and here we have the core area buffer area and human habitat areas so this comes with more, both the ecosystem conservation and minimum human interference and also a better management of the environment and this the biosphere reserves they come under the iucn category 5 protected areas and then reserved and protected forests these come under the category 4 or 6 so that is depending on the protection accorded and here the logging hunting grazing and other activities may be permitted on a sustainable basis to the members of certain community and in the reserved forest explicit permission is required for such activities but in the protected forests such activities are allowed unless they are explicitly prohibited so here the permission is more and here the prohibition is more so remember the difference between the reserves and the protected forests okay so these are not as stringent as a national park or a wildlife sanctuary so but obvious there is some human interference allowed but they are again regulated not absolute interference then conservation and community reserves so they typically act as buffer zones so whenever we talked about the eco sensitive zones they come under these conservation and community reserves so here whenever it is a government land so they are called as conservation reserves so there the local panchayat will act as a regulator and whenever a community is owning the land so that are called as community reserves and here the community maintains them so community reserves are informal and then the village and panchayat forests so it is governed by the local communities so any village if it is declaring any of the area as the forest area and that will be looked after looked after by the uh, village people so they are called the village or panchayat forest so here one good example is the tongya forests okay so the tongya people near up bihar region so they are the forest dwellers and whenever they have set up their own villages they will also look after the surrounding environment then the private protected areas so if any person who has set up forest in his private land so that is also declared as a private protected area and if he gets certification of the government then he will be safeguarded his trees and others will be safeguarded from illegal felling of trees or might be the wildlife present in that area will be safeguarded against illegal poaching say for example if you have a sandalwood forest or if you have a teak forest so the government makes sure that you will be given the some protection so because of those trees are precious in nature and also the wildlife present there so they will also be precious and then conservation areas so these are the unique ones and this is basically between the indo us project okay so that indo us partnership project so that ran between 1996 to 2002 and these areas are home to many conservation reliant species so whichever animal or plant species that are relying on the conservation else they will become extinct so those are being added here so this is the indo us partnership so just like whenever we come up with any trade so that will be added up so the same way here also as a matter of friendship so this was added into this ecology and then 
the global conservation assured tiger standards so the cats so we have been seeing this whenever we come across the tiger census and others and here we have to make sure that this is not an organization this is not an ngo it is a standard it is a, a measurement benchmark so india recently it went to apply cats standards across all tiger reserves thereby giving boost to conservation efforts so now all the tiger reserves so they will be benchmarked they will be assessed and measured against these cats standards so cats standards will come with some 12 to 13 criteria like what is the human interference there so how many uh, tigers are there what is the density of population what is the ecosystem what is the density of their prey so all these will be set as the standard and whenever we measure a tiger reserve in this cat standard so we will be given some marks out of 100 so now onwards every tiger reserve will be evaluated and marks will be allotted to them and against which standard they are measuring against the cats standard so cats is a conservation tool that sets best practice and standards to manage tiger the target practices and then it encourages assessment to benchmark the progress so it is not an organization it is an assessment tool and it was launched in 2013 and the tool was developed in collaboration with the tiger experts and government agencies so basically the asian ministerial conference was held and the conference thought out that the tiger range countries should come together and they set the target of doubling the tiger okay so that is tx2 target and as per this target so they set up a standard that is cats so these cats will measure them so here remember the relation between the asia ministerial conference of tiger range nations and the pledge of tx2 and then the cats so this is the organization and this is the target and this is the measurement tool then come to next operation olivia so operation olivia is carried out annually to protect olive ridley turtles during their breeding habitats and protect their habitats so here only during the breeding seasons okay this becomes profound okay in other times so they will go to the lean season back and it was launched in december 2020 in collaboration with odisha state forest department and the indian coast guards so remember this point carefully so indian coast guards so although they belong to the defense or home ministry so they are involved in this ecological conservation hence this is a skewed you cannot take guesswork in such so that is why remember then the coast guard vessels will ensure that no fishing vessels will enter the breeding sites like the damra river and rushikulia beach okay so no fishing will be uh, happening during these seasons whenever operation olivia is going on and coast guards are going to safeguard them and coming to the information about olive ridley turtles their scientific name is Lepidocalis olivaceae. So, Lepidocalis olivaceae is the scientific name and the family is Kelonidae. And the mass nesting comes in Aridaba and the IUCN status is vulnerable. So, it is not endangered or critically endangered and it belongs to appendix 1 of sites. So, whenever appendix of sites come, so remember appendix 1, 2 and 3. So, 1 maximum punishment, 2 minimum punishment and 3 the animals will be set up only if any nation comes up and says that this animal has to be included so it is not the global the third schedule it belongs only to those nations which are willing to put any animal into that appendix then olive ridley turtles are found in relatively shallow marine waters around the world so remember this shallow marine so they don't go to deep oceans then coming to next bernardi wildlife sanctuary so recently the world wildlife fund for nature india found a new tigers inhabitating in the Bernadi wildlife sanctuary in Assam and this is one of the smallest wildlife sanctuary of Assam and covers an area of 26 square kilometers and Bernadi wildlife sanctuary is located in the northern Assam's Baksa and Udalgari district bordering Bhutan so remember this and then the sanctuary is bordered by Bernadi river and Nalapada river so to the west and east respectively and it was affirmed as the wildlife sanctuary in 1980s so way back and then Bernadi was established to protect pygmy hog and hispid air. So pygmy hog means it is a pig, hispid air means it is a rabbit. So remember and go through the pictures of these and just have a memory of them. And the main forest types of this Bernadi is the tropical moist deciduous. So it is not the dry deciduous, it is moist deciduous. So here we again have one additional fact is that 
wherever the Arunachal Pradesh and Assam uh, wildlife sanctuaries are there. So, there tropical type of climate is also present. So, we had many questions like in which of the following all the tree tropical temperate tundra is present. So, for such questions these act as the hint. Then most of the natural vegetation have been cleared for planting the Bombax, Sibia, Tectona grandis and Eucalyptus. So, these are the new generation plants that are being planted by the government as a mark of afforestation programs. So, now most of the natural vegetation have been cut and the artificial vegetation has been taken up. So, here whenever you study a national park or a wildlife sanctuary, make sure that you will have a google map of it and then revise. So, here we have Bernadi. So, in the Indo-Bhutan border we have and very nearer to it, here we have the Royal Manas National Park and Manas National Park of India and very next to it we have Sunai Rupai and Pakke Tiger Reserve, Nameri is here, so Dafla Range, Dafla Hills is here, Brahmaputra River flows, so you will make sure that you all these you will revise and you will save these PPTs so that it will be the best preparation for ecology. Then Litoria Mira, so here the cocoa colored frog, so that have turned out to be a new species and it was discovered in New Guinea. So, it was done by a research team led by Griffith University and it is called Litoria Mira inspired by the Latin adjective Miram. So, it is a Latin name which means surprised or a stranger and the Litoria Mira as a well known relative that is the common green tree frog of Australia called Litoria cerulean. Okay. So, this resembles a tree frog of Australia and then except for the color of their skin, the two seem alike. So, this is a twin of the African tree frog except that it is brownish in color and the African tree frog it is greenish in color. So, such new species whenever they are discovered, so they become important. So, with figure make sure that you preserve this. Then Dihing Patkai, so this became Assam's sixth national park. So, some say sixth, some say seventh, so whatever it may be. Okay, then the Assam government has decided to upgrade Dihing Patkai wildlife sanctuary into a national park. Then the announcement comes after the National Board for Wildlife have conditional gave conditional clearance to a coal mining project by Coal India Limited. Say for example, National Board for Wildlife gave the permission to mine in these areas. So now Assam government came up and they make sure that we will upgrade this to National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary. So now if it is declared as the National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary, so but obvious no human interference will be allowed. So, Assam government is doing this to protect the Dihing Patkai from this mining. So, but obvious again, the National Board for Wildlife itself, it should declare it as a national park. So, we have to make sure that we will see that in this perspective. Then, Dihing Patkai Wildlife Sanctuary is located within the larger Dihing Patkai Elephant Reserve. So, we mark this, the Dihing Patkai Elephant Reserve and it is also known as Jaipur Rainforest. So, Jaipur. So, this is not JAI of Rajasthan, this is in Assam. Then, Dihing is the name of the river that flows through this forest and Patkai is the hill. So, at the foot of which the sanctuary lies. So, we make sure that Dihing, the name of the river and Patkai hills. So, between Dihing and Patkai, it lies. Then, the oldest refinery of Asia in Digboy and the open cast coal mine at Lido are located near the sanctuary. So, if you have a Google map and if you make sure that you will have so, if you have a Google map and if you make sure that all these places you locate and preserve it in the form of a PPT, so that would be a great preparation. Then, it is famous for Assam Valley Tropical Wet Evergreen Forest. So, that is bordering Arunachal Pradesh. So, again the tropical wet evergreen, not the moist deciduous. So, wet evergreen. Then, Assamese macaque, a primate found in the forest, is in the red list of the near threatened species. So, remember the Assam is macaw. Macaw means monkey and it has the highest concentration of rare endangered white winged wood duck. So, mark this white winged wood duck. So, here we have so many assignments to be done. So, go through the map and see the geographical locations of all these and at the same time see the pictures of Assam is macaw and then the white winged wood duck and get their the IUCN status especially of this white winged wood duck. Then, Come to next, Garyals. So, recently Department of Punjab Forest and Wildlife Preservation in collaboration with the World Wildlife Fund for Nature India has released a lot of 24 Garyals into 
the bias conservation reserve so mark this and then uh, remember the scientific name of gavial that is gavialis gangeticus so gavialis gangeticus is the scientific name of gavial then gavial also known as gavial or the fish eating crocodile and it is a crocodilian in the family gavilidae and among the longest of all living crocodilians so it is not the largest only the longest so the length is only the large and then the adult males have a distinct boss at the end of the snout which resembles an earthenware pot known as gara hence the name gavial so just behind its long mouth so here it is having a pot like structure so that is why it is called gavial gavial it is having the name from gara meaning pot then the habitats include fresh waters of northern india that is chambal then gagra gandak and sun river and then sun or sone then fossil gavials remains fossils of gavial remains were excavated in pliocene deposits in shivalik hills and narmada river valley so from shivalik to narmada so from indus gangetic and even to godavari so till there we can uh, track the presence of gavials so earlier they were present in most of north india okay now they are restricted only to chambal and some other rivers earlier they were more in number and it has been listed as critically endangered on the iucn red list okay so all these facts of gavials we remember then undp report on hindu kush ecosystem so this is not unep undp so make sure that undp is also significantly present in environment and ecology sector so coming to undp so the undp report that named melting glaciers threatened livelihoods confronting the climate change to save the third pole so the third pole the hindu kush or the himalayas it is called the third pole so that is why the word then the hindu kush himalayan mountain ranges could lose up to 2/3 of its ice by 2100 and about 2 billion people may face food water shortages by 2100 so all these we just make sure that there is no extremity in these statistics so that if you know that is more than sufficient we can take a smart guess we need not by heart every report given by every organization then recommendation shifting away from fossil fuel use in energy transport and others so we are also going for zeroing the coal usage so in that context it becomes important then changing diets and agricultural practices so we should go for vegetarianism and we should go for the sustainable agricultural practices then improve data and information capacity so we should make sure that environmental data is collected and according to that data we plan our programs to conserve and preserve the environment then avicenia marina so scientists of department of biotechnology have reported for the first time a reference grade whole genome sequence of the true mangrove species avicenia marina so this is a famous mangrove tree and the scientists of department of biotechnology they have done the complete genome sequencing of these so in every segment of the gene what is present so they have studied so that's why it becomes important then avicenia marina is one of the most prominent mangrove species found in all mangrove formations in india so it is most common ones and it is a salt secreting and extraordinarily salt tolerant mangrove species that grows optimally in 75% sea water and tolerates more than 250% of sea water so it is highly tolerant to the salt and it is among the rare plant species which can excrete 40% of the salt through the salt glands in the leaves so it has its salt glands in the leaves and it can excrete the excess salt from there and besides its extraordinary capacity to exclude salt entry to the roots so the roots should not take the salt only the leaves so they will take and emit it out okay so these are some of the things regarding avicenia marina and then india's first cryptogamic garden so here cryptogamy phenogamy gymnosperme angiosperme so all these become important okay so recently india's first cryptogamic garden was inaugurated in the chakrata town of dehradun uttarakhand and the garden will be housing nearly 50 species of lichens ferns and fungi so lichens ferns and fungi all these the questions have come in the previous and even in the 2021 prelims questions were there for all these then this garden is at dioban in chakrata at a height of 9000 feet so we know that these lichens ferns and fungi they live only in the tundra region so that is why at this height then dioban has pristine majestic forests of deodar and oak 
so mark these cedar deodar oak so these are the important forests that is the temperate forests of himalayas okay and then coming to cryptogams a cryptogam is a plant that reproduces with the help of spores okay so they don't produce any seeds no fertilization occur only the spores will be there the word cryptogamy implies hidden reproduction that is they do not produce any reproductive structure like a seed or a flower these are non flowering plants and algae bryophyta then lichens ferns okay fungi are the best known groups of cryptogams friends deeply going with the taxonomy fungi so that is a different kingdom so in brief we discuss about the kingdoms here we have the kingdom monera and we have kingdom protista then we have kingdom fungi and then we have kingdom plant and animalia so monera so this is the virus and bacteria then protista means protozoans and then fungi so all your mushrooms fungus will come under there and then plantae and animalia and this under kingdom plantae we have this cryptogamy and phanerogamy that is seed producing and non seed producing plants so under this cryptogamy we have thallophyta bryophyta and tridophyta so all these with pictures we will discuss in future so as of now so all these thallophyta bryophyta and tridophyta all these come under the cryptogamy so make sure that we will remember these things then norovirus at least 13 people have been found infected with norovirus in kerala's vayana district and norovirus is a bug similar to the diarrhea including rotavirus so rotavirus we know that it is the diarrhea causing pathogen so the same way norovirus so norovirus and rotavirus they have the similar symptoms and it is a group of viruses that causes gastrointestinal illness and disease outbreaks typically occur aboard the cruise ships in the nursing homes then dormitories and other closed spaces so wherever we have closed spaces and wherever we have too much of human human interactions so there this virus will inbreed and it will spread and here the norovirus is highly contagious and can be transmitted through contaminated food water and surfaces so it can transmit through the food and water and the primary route is oral and fecal so oral by mouth so so the saliva and others and fecal the feces and one may get infected multiple times as the virus has different strains so just like covid 19 so there are people who have got infection in all the three waves so first second third so the same way in the norovirus also so we can get multiple infections then norovirus is resistant to many disinfectants and can heat up to 60 degree celsius so it is a very very high heat tolerating virus and therefore merely steaming food or chlorinating water does not kill the virus so we will mark this such statements will become important for upsc okay so by heating a water which of the virus can be killed so in that norovirus will be added and blindly if you eat all of the above then you will be the losers then the virus can also survive many common hand sanitizers so this also we remember then the disease is self limiting so although this norovirus causes diarrhea like symptoms but it is limited so after 2 to 3 days the dysentery will go on its own so we need not worry about the treatment and prevention of the disease it is a mild dysentery that occurs then conservation of vultures in india so here friends the action plan for vulture conservation 2020 to 2025 so this target was released so that's why we brought it and the action plan for vulture conservation was launched in 2006 so this is the new target but the plan was launched much before and under this the veterinary use of diclofenac was banned so we know that diclofenac is the main culprit behind vultures this diclofenac so this is a bioaccumulant so whenever we use painkillers your moose volini spray all these are diclofenacs so that will accumulate in our body and when vultures eat us or when they eat the cattle so that diclofenac will accumulate in the vulture's kidney and their kidneys will fail and due to neck dropping they will die so if we ban diclofenac but obvious we can conserve these vultures then the conservation efforts of india are primarily focused on the critically endangered and endangered species of vultures so we have several uh, small billed vulture long billed vulture white back vulture okay, red headed vulture so all these vultures we have so we discuss those also in the coming classes so as of now we concentrate on the conservation efforts then the vulture conservation breeding program has been established by the central zoological authority and the bombay natural history society 
so this vulture conservation and breeding program so here we have some two to three breeding centers and especially in pinjor haryana we have one famous breeding center so we remember that and presently there are nine vulture conservation and breeding centers okay so that was the first one and we have nine now and apart from that we have vulture restaurants so that means we are keeping some fresh meat which is devoid of diclofenac to the vultures to eat and fly away so just like we have restaurants for us so for the vultures also restaurants are being constructed then we have vulture safe zones so andhra pradesh and punjab governments they have vulture safe zones so just like the tiger reserves we have the vulture safe zones that is an environment and ecosystem con conducive for these vultures okay then coming to the last part friends see whenever we are going to achieve something so but obvious we will be having the fear fear of failure but the thing is that there is only 2% of population who have that ability to overcome that fear and there is only 2% of population in this world who have that inner resolution to succeed okay and only those people will succeed else all others they will have a normal life and they will die as a normal people if at all you have that instinct to live as an extraordinary person to live that ultimate life of living so make sure that you will take the risk you will hunt down your dreams and make sure that you will be in the successful stage at least from now on and if you are one of them have a pride if you are not try to become among those 2% of population so do it all the very best good luck friends